This is Europe and the United States in the 20th century, and this is lecture 10. And today I want to talk a little bit about well, the title of the lecture, Empire by Integration, the United States and the European Project. And as the title of today's lecture suggests, I want to consider the role that the United States plays in the process of European integration that gets underway, really, I suppose, beginning late 1940s um, and the process kind of continues through the 50s 60s and pretty much all the way up till of course the present day but for our purposes we're more concerned with the early period um, of European integration and as I say the role that the United States plays um, in that process okay the origins of the of European integration so by way of introduction um, my general argument the thesis, if you like, um, is encapsulated in the first point on the list here. And that is that the United States played a pivotal role in the process. So the general argument I would put forward, and I think this is based um, largely, or to, to a large degree anyway, on the research that Guy Lundestad has done in this area, um, one of the books on the reading list is, is where I've taken the title of the lecture from, Empire by Integration. Integration. And essentially, you know, Lundestad's argument, which I broadly uh, agree with, is that European integration probably would not have happened when it did, and perhaps not in the way that it did, had not been for the United States. And I want to consider some of the ways that uh, the United States actually uh, um, influenced uh, these processes. However, when you look at the sort of conventional narratives on the history of European integration, what is often the case is that the United States is, is either left out entirely or plays a fairly minimal role in the narrative. And as I say, I think the kind of conventional view sort of underplays um, the role of the United States. And I think there are several reasons for that. The second point I put here is that it doesn't really fit into the overarching narrative of European history. The, I suppose the conventional narrative being is that Europe experiences two horrific wars in the first half of the 20th century. After the end of World War II, a group of enlightened European leaders came together realized that they had to do something to prevent a third catastrophic war and embarked upon this very ambitious project of at first economic integration then followed by greater political integration and that is what effectively uh, it is these processes that effectively confine war um, to uh, uh, to the past um and yes, the United States doesn't tend to fit into this into this narrative. For you know, for obvious reasons, the Europeans like to think that European integration, the European Community, this was you know this was something that was constructed by the Europeans themselves. The thought that an outside power might have in any way kind of influenced this process. This is something, as I say, that that that, that Europeans uh, you know were somewhat reluctant, let's say, to acknowledge. Uh, a couple of other points to make here. First of all, obviously, I, I'm, I'm not going to labour this point because I'm sure uh, um, most people already know this, but the idea of a united Europe or a European federation of some description, that had been an idea that was kicking around for a long time. Um, after the First World War, there were several organisations, including in Britain, which kind of wanted to, which promoted this vision of a united or a federal Europe. Um, if you wanted to be really cynical, you could argue that at various junctures there were there had been European leaders, um, kings, dictators who ha also held had this vision of a united Europe. Um, you could take this back to Napoleon. Um, Obviously, during the Second World War, Hitler had his vision of European unity. A more controversial point, of course, uh, is that you know some historians have argued that um, there is some kind of lineage, if you like, between Hitler's vision of a new order um, and the sort of Europe which sort of emerges in the post-war period. Essentially, if you like, you know, a, a Europe in which Germany was a sort of driving economic power 
Um, you know, arguably, if you wanted to be really, really controversial, maybe this is a sort of British view coming to coming to the surface here. But you could argue that you know, if you look at today's European Union, um, you know, Angela Merkel is obviously by some distance probably the dominant that figure factor, let's say, in European politics. Um, obviously, though, I, 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 yeah, I think this I think this idea is slightly questionable, not least because, of course, you know that that you know, Hitler's vision was underpinned by a distinctly racist uh, um, order, which uh, obviously today's European Union has completely, you know, is completely jettisoned. Um, but nonetheless, as I say, a vision of a united Europe that that was something that had been kicking around for a long time. Um, obviously, though. It's the circumstances of the late 1940s and the fact that the Second World War has come to an end. Germany has been defeated. That lays, if you like, the groundwork for a, for the future uh, European project, if I can put it that way. Uh, it should also be noted, and we'll come back to this, that Churchill, um, at the end of the Second World War, also argued forcefully that there should be a united Europe. So, so, so Churchill, you know, probably I would say the most important and most significant European statesman um, in the late 1940s, early 1950s. He too very much sort of embraced mm -hmm. the vision of a united Europe. But as I say, we will come on to that and perhaps, you know, a more interesting question in some, in some ways is Churchill's own view of what, um, uh, um, of Britain's uh, role within that. Uh, okay, let's bring the United States into the picture. Um, I have a quotation here, uh, which is quoted, in, I think, in Hearden's article on early American views of European integration. Um, and this goes from a document from what is the American Foreign Economic Administration saying we need a productive, thriving Europe as a market for our goods. It does no good to raise wheat or make automobiles for export if the foreign purchaser has no money to pay for our products. And he won't have money to pay for them unless he too is producing and selling. Um, so here, this document kind of acknowledges that it is in America's own best interests. Uh, first of all, I suppose, to try and assist in the revival of the European economy once the war has come to an end. Um, and the idea that I suppose European integration was going to play an important role in getting the European economy back up and running again. Um, again, if you think about the circumstances when the war comes to an end and American thinking, um, there are a number of factors influencing, uh, for, first of all, I suppose the Roosevelt administration and then the Truman's uh, Truman administration's vision for a post-war you know, global economic order. One of the key things that influences their vision is the experience of the global depression in the early 1930s. And I think during the Second World War, there was considerable concern about what would happen to the global economy once the war had actually come to an end. I think there was a general fear that you know, once war production came to an end, perhaps the world could again be pitched back into another economic depression. Obviously, policymakers were trying to were determined to try and avoid that scenario. Um, and so policymakers and you know, principally, I would say in the United States and Britain, kind of come together and start um, putting in place designs for a future uh, economic order. Uh, and in this regard, there's a very important conference or summit that takes place in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, um, in which a number, in fact, I, I think most uh, of the world's industrialized economies, at least on the Allied side, attend this uh, attend this meeting. As I say, the British and the Americans are the sort of dominant players during the session. Uh, John Maynard Keynes, the British economist, is there and plays a very influential role. Uh, and essentially, the vision entails that the global economy would be managed through a variety of international institutions. So they draw up plans for an international monetary fund, a World Bank, uh, 
uh, the Global Agreement of Tariffs and Trade, which was designed to try and remove tariff barriers between states, um, and which today has sort of been transformed into the World Trade Organization. And the general idea is that, yeah, these institutions would regulate the global economy uh, in an effort to try and prevent another major economic crisis. Um, the Soviet Union is actually present at this summit, but chooses not to participate in these various institutions. Obviously, the Soviet Union was not part of the sort of wider global capitalist economy. So this is the scenario. As I say, the war comes to an end and there is this vision um, for a new international economic order. However, of course, Europe's situation, its economic situation in 1945 is, to put it mildly, rather desperate um you know i think we've talked about this before but you know the general point is i mean i said first point here europe in 1945 is a wasteland well parts of it certainly were a wasteland you know germany for, would be the outstanding example uh i think i've said before you know the further east you go in europe the worse it gets so you know um, germany badly badly uh, damaged um, as a result of the war, cities lying in ruins as a result of the Allied strategic bombing campaign. Um, the Allied armies had fought right into the heart of Germany itself. And then, of course, further to the east, you've got Poland, you know, Poland having experienced, uh, uh, you know, the partition in 1939, the Germans advancing through the eastern parts of territory, uh, eastern parts of Polish territory in 1941, the Red Army coming back. Uh, added to that, you know, the mass killings, the genocide, uh, the Holocaust, you know, so Poland, yeah, too. And then further east as well, you know, you've got Russia and, and as I said before, nobody knows exactly how many people are killed uh, during what the Russians describe as the Great Patriotic War, but anywhere, you know, from 20, 30, maybe even more than that, than that perish as a result of the war. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, as I say, it's too much of a generalisation to say that Europe as a whole is a wasteland. You know, some countries experience greater levels of destruction than others. Obviously, those countries which remained neutral, there weren't many, but there were a handful of countries which managed to maintain their neutrality during the war, were relatively unscathed by the fighting itself, although their, econo their economies uh, had been badly disrupted. Uh, Southern Ireland, for example, which in a couple of years would become the Republic of Ireland. Um, yeah, Republic of Ireland remained neutral throughout the war, but there was a large degree of economic disruption to the extent that actually rationing in Ireland actually lasts longer than in Britain. So when policymakers, economists, people are surveying Europe um, in 1945, um one way of looking at it is that you know there's a pessimistic and an optimistic view the optimistic view basically says it's going to take about 15 years for europe to recover from the war uh, the pessimists basically say no the job is too big there's no way that europe can fully come back from this what is therefore surprising is that when you look at you um western europe's economic performance after the second world war uh, the surprising thing is that Europe rebounds extremely quickly. In fact, by, I think I've got this on the PowerPoint, yeah, I do the penultimate point. Um, by 1948, most countries level, in Western Europe we're talking about now, most European countries' levels of production were greater than that of 1939. So in other words, within three years of the war, as I said, most European countries, in terms of their industry at least, were already outproducing uh, when, uh, uh, you know, what the situation was uh, before the war. Now, this could be taken as an indication that, uh, um, now I suppose that statistic has to be slightly qualified. First of all, 1939 was not necessarily a particularly good year. Um, many countries were still coming out of the depression. In fact, in France, you know, France goes into the depression somewhat later than most of the rest of the world. Rest of the world. So, 1939 was not a particularly good year to begin with. 
Um, but nonetheless, you know, it kind of reflects the fact that uh, um, now one of the reasons why this was possible was if we go back to uh, point uh, number four on our on the uh, on the PowerPoint here. Um, yeah, the main reason for this is that actually when the rubble was cleared and people had the opportunity to actually survey the extent of the damage, um, what they found was that the level of destruction was not quite as extensive as was first, you know, as, as was first thought, as it was th first thought to be. Um, and uh, in particular, I mean, one piece of evidence for this is that the United States Air Force conducts a strategic bombing survey in Europe and Japan at the end of the Second World War, just to get an, uh, get an idea as to exactly how much destruction uh, they have managed to achieve through their strategic uh, bombing campaign against uh, Germany and Japan. And they found out that actually the bombing had been much less that much less effective than they had than they had believed to be the case at the time. The main reason for that was that this was in obviously in an age before smart weapons and things like that, um, which meant that it was virtually impossible, especially at night, to target particular factories or pieces of industry or other targets of strategic value. Um, the result being that there was actually a fair amount of industry uh, or fair amount of uh, uh, productive facilities which were still intact. So as I say, once the rubble had been cleared away, it proved to be much, much easier to get the factories up and running again than, you know, than was first believed to be the case. So in the late 1940s, then, it's not so much an economic problem that the Europeans are experiencing. Uh, in the sense that, you know, they're finding it difficult to uh, get the factories uh, producing stuff again. It's more of a financial problem in the sense that as various European countries go about reconstructing their economies, um, they need to import capital equipment. So the sort of stuff that you need to, as I say, to get your factories moving, moving again. Um, and the only country in the world which was capable of providing this was the United States. The result being that uh, by the late, but you know, by 46, 47, most European countries were facing a sort of, uh, this is where I show that I'm not an economist, but I believe that they're kind of show, basically facing a sort of uh, uh, um, uh, a balance of uh, credit crisis. Um, in the sense that there's more money coming out of Europe than coming in. The, United, the Europeans are having to purchase goods from the United States. But 46, 47, they have very little to sell in return. So I'll say that, you know, it's basically a huge, not just a trade gap, but a kind of financial gap sort of begins to, uh, uh, be, begins to develop between uh, the Europeans and the United States. Um, and this is the um uh, context for the Marshall Plan um which is announced by George C Marshall um who by 1947 was Harry Truman's secretary of state he announces this at Harvard University in June 1947 i think um and when Marshall makes this announcement he couches the plan very much in humanitarian terms saying that it was the job you know it was going to be the purpose of the united states to provide the economic assistance which would allow europe to recover from the war and to kind of try and uh, um, clamber their way out of poverty and things like that one thing that we have noted and we talked about this um, in our discussion on the origins of the cold war the marshall plan was actually an integral element in the overarching strategy of containment against the soviet union which was beginning to emerge um, at roughly this uh, at this time so in short the united states did have very good strategic reasons for helping the europeans to recover economically most significantly, the vision was that a strong Western Europe would be a bulwark against communism. In other words, the best way 
to ensure that uh, the Soviet Union didn't expand into Western Europe was to was to reconstruct Western Europe economically. That would leave Europe less vulnerable to communist influence. Um, and as the um, uh, you know, as the slide here shows, the uh, US basically pumps almost $13 billion into Western Europe between 1948-51. A conditional Marshall aid, uh, I should say the Marshall Plan becomes known as the European Reconstruction Plan. Um, and a conditional Marshall, uh, conditional Marshall aid is that the Western European states had to coordinate their efforts through uh, what becomes known as the Organization of European Economic and Cooperation. Um, so from the beginning, Marshall Aid, if you like, was conditional on uh, the various European governments uh, working together. So you know, the, the, the Americans were basically promoting a form of multilateral cooperation. Um, and the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development was also uh, established in order to assist in the administration and overseeing of the plan. Um, there's a debate as to exactly how important the plan is in terms of Western Europe's economic recovery. Um, there are skeptics who basically argue that the plan was unnecessary in the sense that in their belief Western Europe was actually well on the way to recovery and that the plan did actually little to influence Western Europe's subsequent uh, economic performance and their, their evidence for this is to, is to say that even before the American money arrives um, most European economies were, had already you know begun to had, had already progressed quite far in terms of economic reconstruction. Um, I'm somewhat skeptical of this as I say it was not so much an economic problem that the Europeans were facing but rather a financial one. Um, so without American money, it, it, it seems to me, at least, and I think there are, I would, I would imagine the majority of historians perhaps would agree with this assessment. Um, it seems to me, unlike, or quite possible anyway, let's put it this way, quite possible that Europe's economic recovery could have come, could have come to a spluttering halt around 1948, uh, simply because the Europeans would have lacked the money to continue importing the goods they need to get their to, 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 to get their economies up and running again. Moreover, I th again, I think it's debatable that whether um, Western Europe's economic performance in the 1950s and 60s would have been quite so good had it not been for the Marshall Plan um, in well, um, announced in 1947, but which, as I say, kind of comes into effect in 1948. Um, which brings us on to the so-called Western European economic miracle. Um, and the word miracle is used in order to basically describe uh, you know, the relative economic success that most Western European countries experience in the 1950s, 60s. In fact, it sort of lasts all the way into, I suppose, the early 70s, the French uh, refer to this period as the 30 glorious years. In other words, the French themselves sort of acknowledged that this was a particularly uh, unusual period, that this was a, uh, you know, in, unusual in terms of France's overall prosperity. Now, this table here gives an indication that um, the levels of growth, the levels of economic growth that European countries uh, experienced was not evenly distributed. Some countries did rather better than others. Um, but nonetheless, you know, across the board, uh, European countries enter into a period of prolonged, prolonged and sustained economic growth, which comes as something of a surprise if you think about the economic experience of experiences of most European countries in the 1920s and 1930s, you know, it's one of just kind of instability, turbulence, depression. Um, so as I say, the 19, late 40s, 1950s, 1960s comes as a very welcome surprise to most Western Europe's, Western Europeans, simply because, as I say, their economic performance uh, 
when put in, particularly when placed into the context of, 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 of previous decades, was so uh, you know was so good in these years. Um, so I should just quickly point out one or two things from the table. Uh, if we had, if this was a league table, then obviously Germany would be at the top, uh, managing to, managing to achieve almost eight percent per year um, at average growth uh, between 1948 and 63. Um, not far behind uh, Italy, then Austria, France, uh, etc. And bottom of the league table, as ever, is Britain with a fairly sort of tepid two and a half percent. Um, a couple of points to make about the economic miracle. First of all, uh, West Germany, Italy, and in brackets, Japan, the most successful of the post-war industrialized economies. What do they have in common? Of course, these are the three losing states. Um, and there is a sort of anecdote that in the course of, the, I guess, early 1960s or so, um, Harold Macmillan, the British prime minister, he's working in his office in Downing Street. Uh, one of his officials comes in somewhat, you know, somewhat uncertainly, reluctantly, puts down the latest economic statistics in front of him, and Macmillan looks at them and sighs and says, "Oh, if only we'd been defeated during the war and had all our debts cancelled, maybe we would be enjoying the same kinds of economic growth as West Germany." Um, but it sort of did beg the question, you know, who had actually lost the war in the end? Uh, with, you, as I say, West Germany experiencing this uh, uh, particularly uh, prosperous period in its history. Um, it's worth noting as well, third point, you know, Britain, even in Britain, as I said, Britain is, Britain's at the bottom of the league table with barely two and a half percent growth. Um, yet even in Britain, there was this sort of recognition that um, you know, the economic growth that they were experiencing was particularly unusual. Um, piece of evidence for this 1959 election campaign, the slogan of the Conservative Party is life's better under the Conservatives. Apparently, at one point in the campaign, Harold Macmillan, the Conservative Party leader, Prime Minister, says, you've never had it so good. Well, if Macmillan could say that to the British, then you, you, what would, you know, um, Conrad Adenauer, for example, the West German Chancellor, say to his people. Um, in fact, Germany, you know, and it is a is a is a case in point in this in this sense. Uh, you know, the West Germans talk about the Wirtschaftswunder uh, again, the sort of economic wonder that uh, that uh, uh, um, develops after 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 the Second Second World War. Um, and yeah, the word wonder, miracle, however you want to put it, um, from a German perspective, particularly if you were of a German, particularly if you were a German of a, of, of, of a certain generation, maybe you'd been born late 19th century, witnessed the outbreak of the First World War, seen your country defeated, ex uh, you know, experienced the very harsh peace settlement that was imposed upon Germany. Uh, the hyperinflation of the early 1920s, then the Nazis coming to power, World War II, seeing your country destroyed, occupied, uh, thoroughly vanquished. Then, you know, as I say, if you were that generation in the 1950s, 1960s, probably the word miracle or wonder would not have seemed much of an exaggeration. Um, a couple of things to quickly mention about uh, Europe's economic performance, though, uh, first of all, I think it does play quite an important role in sort of restoring West Germany back to respectability. Um, the fact that, you know, so many European countries were doing business with the Germans in the 1950s and 1960s means that, if you like, the memory of things like Auschwitz and the Holocaust, etc., you know, that begins to fade surprisingly quickly, I think. As I said, Germany is rehabilitated, West Germany, I should say, is rehabilitated surprisingly quickly uh, after, after the Second World War. Um, arguably, it also serves to strengthen Western Europe politically. Next lecture, I'll talk a little bit about 
the way the sort of transatlantic relationship develops in the 1950s and 1960s. But for now, it's worth noting that obviously Western Europe's economic situation changes very, very significantly from the late 40s through the 50s and 60s. And that obviously does have consequences in terms of Western Europe's wider relationship with the United States. The American view of European integration, well, as we've already noted, in general, the United States supports the idea of a some kind of um, European federation. Uh, and the point that you'll understand, we'll, maybe we'll explore this in more detail um, in our seminar. Uh, but one of the points Lundestad makes is that in general, the United States was rather disappointed at the pace of European integration in the 1950s. There was a general feeling that the Europeans should be proceeding rather more quickly than they actually were. Um, Lundestad also makes the point that the Americans were were looking for a European power to, to, to play perform a leadership role. And in the late 1940s, it seemed as though Britain would be the ideal candidate, that Britain, you know, um, the one European country which was on the winning side at the end of the Second World War, Churchill, who we've already mentioned, you know, a very keen supporter of European integration. Um, so Britain, in a number of ways, seemed to fit the bill. The problem, though, is that the British weren't willing to play this role. Um, there's a, la a Labour government comes into power in Britain after 1945, and the feeling within the Labour Party at this time is that European integration is not something that they can really embrace. So eventually it becomes France. In fact, you know, the key, some of the key figures in the whole history of European integration come from France. One of them is Monet, who, who incidentally has very strong transatlantic connections. He spends a large part of the war, for example, in the United States. Uh, he, he, had a, he had close relations with American businessmen. Um, crucially, Monet was not a Gaullist in the sense that he was not, uh, you know, he was not one of General de Gaulle's supporters during the war. He, he was somewhat detached from General, which again is significant given the fact that de Gaulle was rather sceptical of European integration. And again, we'll talk about de Gaulle um, in more detail on another occasion. Um, and the final point I think is worth noting is that in the 1950s, at least, the Americans are somewhat resistant to the idea, to the British idea of some kind of wider transatlantic community. The American vision in the 1950s is of a, of a group of European states integrating quite deeply with one another. They don't like the vision, they don't like this vision of a wider but rather shallower uh, transatlantic community, which the British are attempting to promote. Um, the British view of European integration. Uh, this comes from a Foreign Office observer at the Messina summit, which is where the where various European leaders met to start drawing up the Treaty of Rome, Tre Treaty of Rome, I should say, uh, which leads to the foundation of the European Community. Um, and the quotation here, the future treaty which you are discussing has no chance of being agreed. If it was agreed, it would have no chance of being ratified. If it were ratified, it would have no chance of being applied. And if it were applied, it would be truly, uh, sorry, totally unacceptable to Britain. So I think it's fair to say mid to late 1950s, the British were decidedly enthused, unenthusiastic about the idea of European integration and simply wanted no real part in this project. I think there were several reasons for that. First and foremost, Britain had won the war. I think that is significant because the British experience of the war, at a psychological level at least, was rather different from, say, France or Germany. You know, ultimately, you know, the British are on the winning side. Churchill is sitting down with Roosevelt and Stalin at Yalta and Potsdam and what have you. Um, <clears throat> De Gaulle isn't there, for example. Germany has been sort of smashed. Um, so I think that makes, you know, that plays an important role um, in why the British are 
less willing to embrace the notion of European integration. Maybe not less willing for the Europeans, but less willing to to uh, consider Britain's own participation within this project. The British also still have an empire um, in the late 40s and 1950s, which we mentioned, albeit that's beginning the process of dismantling it. Um, also, there was the so-called special relationship with the United States. Certainly Churchill uh, had this vision of an English speaking community. But Churchill also, as, I, as we've mentioned before, you know, Churchill also believes in the idea of a united Europe. In fact, you know, he's one of the, uh, I suppose, late 1940s, he, you know, he, he is probably the most significant figure in the European movement. Uh, when the Council of Europe is convened in Strasbourg in the late 1940s, it's Churchill who gives the inaugural address um, in French, albeit extremely bad French or with an extremely bad accent, but nonetheless, you know, he gives the, he gives this address. Um, and yeah, it's interesting because in Britain, the pro-Europeans and the anti-Europeans always say that Churchill was on their side. The pro-Europeans say, look, you know, Churchill believed in a United States of Europe. Um, the problem is, <laughs> of course, is that, yes, Churchill believed in a United States of Europe, meaning Europe, meaning continental Europe, not meaning Britain. You know, when he's asked about this later, he says, yes, I meant, you know, I meant Europe. Not Britain, because Britain, of course, isn't European. Um, not in the Churchillian vision, anyway. Um, so, yeah, as I say, Churchill's own views of European integration were somewhat ambiguous. Yes, he believed that France, Germany, Italy, the Benelux countries should proceed on this course. But he never really embraces the idea of Britain's own participation in this project. Um, on the other hand, I think it would be too strong to say that Britain is sort of detached from Europe um, in these years. For one thing, the British do participate in the Council of Europe, um, which is a sort of embryonic European Parliament, which uh, is established in the late 1940s, pretty much a talking shop doesn't have any real authority but nonetheless there's a feeling that this is the first step towards something bigger but the British I say here you know the British resistant to wider the wider federalist projects uh, crucially the British dis di dislike the idea of supranational institutions the British dislike the idea of sharing their sovereignty or pooling their sovereignty with other countries um, an antipathy that the British never entirely managed to overcome. Uh, when the, even when the British finally do join, you know, they, co they come into the European community mainly for economic reasons, but from the outset, you know, they never entirely embraced the idea of, 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 of a supranational Europe. And you know, fast forwarding the story on, um, yeah, I think that is one of the chief reasons for Brexit uh, and for, you know, why the British ultimately choose <coughs> to vote against the idea of Britain's membership of the European Union in 2016. Um, but, you, you know, you can see this reluctance, you know, right from the beginning. Yes, the British do participate in the Council of Europe. Obviously, the British are also a leading, you know, one of the leading European powers within NATO, another intergovernmental organization, but crucially they decide that they are not going to participate in the coal and steel community, which is a sort of forerunner to uh, the wider European economic community. Okay, the first steps towards European integration, we've got a cover of Time magazine, um, uh, and on the front, Jean Monnet, uh, as I say, the father of the European project. I'm just looking at the uh, cover here. It says, new strength for the West, Europe unites in the common market. Um, first steps towards European integration. Yeah, like with the security structures that emerge, it's a sort of an incremental process. Um, the Benelux countries, that's Belgium, Holland, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, Luxembourg, former customs union in 1948. Um, 
They in France, Germany, and Italy joined then when they did, when they formed the coal and steel community in 1952. Coal and steels chosen because these are the two essential war materials. Um, also, the fact that um, you know the Alsace region, the Saar region, uh, you know, the Ruhr Valley, if you like, these have been the territories which historically have been contested between France and Germany. They were also the big coal production regions. So, sharing control over these areas sort of made sense in terms of sort of resolving the conflict between them. Also, of course, the idea that the greater the degree of interdependence between France and Germany, economic interdependence between France and Germany, uh, would make war difficult between them, if not impossible. Okay, I'm going to pass over a slide very quickly because we'll discuss this in more detail in our discussion, but Lundestad kind of brings out several reasons why the United States um, supports European uh, uh european integration uh i won't go through all of these now but i think you can sort of divide the various reasons between if you like a more slightly ideological even idealist vision that the americans have and more pragmatic reasons rooted in national security concerns as well as economic concerns uh which is why you know the americans are quite keen to sort of promote this process um Added to that, you have the German question. We talked about Germany already, so again, I will not pass. We'll pass over this pretty quickly. But of course, I mean, one of the one, one of the points we made when discussing Germany is that European integration is seen as an important aspect of containing German power. I think I've, I think we've done this before, haven't we? When we uh, talked a little bit about Germany, so I'm kind of probably repeating myself here. So I'll pass over this slide. But crucially, I mean, a point that I made before is that, yes, you wanted to try and tie Germany into European structures. We've also noted that Adenauer himself, uh, the West German Chancellor um, in the 19, um, in the 19, uh, 1950s, <laughs> up, until, up until 1963, um, you know, his vision was to entrench West Germany into European and Atlantic institutions. So Ardenauer himself, you know, Ardenauer himself also sort of recognizes that Germany needs to be tied in, that West Germany needs to be tied into, tied down through these various inst institutions. Um, and then again, we mentioned this before, you know, there is this proposal for a European defense community, which is, which is uh, considered in 1950. Uh, in the in sorry in the in the early 1950s, it's a French proposal, but ultimately voted down by the French National Assembly. Again, I'm not going to recapitulate all that, but it's just another. It's important to note though that the European Defence Community is sort of the mirror image. The idea of a European Defence Community is all sort of the mirror image of the kind of European Economic Community that ultimately emerges. The general point it being that kind of the economic um, rationale for integration was also very much a strategic rationale. So the defence community was one side of the sort of one side of the coin, if you like, which kind of encompassed uh, um, um, economic integration as well. So from the beginning, you know, economic integration, defence integration were seen as 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 inextricably linked, you know, you wanted, you needed a more economically integrated and perhaps eventually politically integrated Europe, uh, for instance, not just for economic reasons, but also uh, for security reasons as well. Ultimately, though, as I say, the idea of a defence community, which is a kind of European army, that collapses. Instead, 1955, West Germany becomes a member of NATO. Um, the Treaty of Rome. Okay, I've got this on the slide. <laughs> there's, a, there's a nice picture I found of the signing of the Treaty of Rome, 1957, which lays the, the groundwork for the establishment of the European Economic Community in the beginning of 1958. Uh, so, so it establishes the European Economic Community, EEC, and Euroton which is a European agency which, which coordinates atomic energy. Um, six original members of the, the six, sorry, the six original members of the European uh, 
uh, coal and steel community participate. Again, the British are invited, but the British exclude themselves. Instead, they establish an alternative um, European trade organization. This is EFTA, the European Free Trade Association, uh, which involves a group of seven mainly northern European states. I always forget exactly who's involved, so I won't, uh, I won't list them off. Uh, but Denmark, certainly. Um, Norway, I'm pretty sure, you know, several Scandinavian countries become yeah, uh, are, are part of this. And EFTA is what it says it is. It's a free trade area. It has none of the sort of political ambitions of the European economic community. So whereas the Treaty of Rome talks about this idea of ever closer union between the various member states, as I say, EFTA from the outset is purely a free trade area. It has no, as I say, it has no wider political mission. So that it is therefore kind of acceptable to the British. The problem is that by 1961, the British have decided that they've made a mistake. So literally within three years of the European community be, getting up and running, the British decide that actually they want to be members after all, something that my more Brexit minded colleagues tend to forget um, in, in, in the sense that, you know, we were once outside the European community and then we very quickly decided we wanted to be part of it. The problem in the 1960s, and again, we'll talk about this in more detail, perhaps in the next class. Um, the problem in the 1960s is that General de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle, is president of France and de Gaulle has decided to decides that he does not want the British to be participating. In fact, he basically reverses France's policy. In the 1950s, the French had been keen for British to be part of the club because they wanted another power to counterbalance Germany. By the 60s, de Gaulle has decided he wants to sort of minimise the Anglo-Saxon influence within Europe. So de Gaulle votes, sorry, de Gaulle vetoes the British application in a very famous press conference, January 1963, says very publicly no to the British, um, and does the same thing again in 1967 when Harold Wilson, uh, the next British Prime Minister, a Labour Prime Minister, applies, puts in an application for membership. Again, de Gaulle says that the British are not yet ready. They are not sufficiently European to be part of this club. Um, <clears throat> For the American perspective, a couple of things to say about American views of the European community. First of all, is yeah, the European community is um, a customs union, he says, trying to remember the economic terminology, um, meaning there is a common external tariff, which basically meant that the European community discriminated against um, American imports. So on the surface, at least, it seemed that the European community was against American economic interests. Um, however, second point now is, is that the United States proves reasonably tolerant about this um, for several reasons. One is obviously the Americans believe that an integrated Western Europe is of strategic interest to the United States. And therefore, the tariff barrier, if you like, is, is, is just a necessary cost for this. So the political benefits of a more integrated Europe sort of trump the economic costs for the United States. Not that the current President Trump would agree with that assessment, but that was the assessment made in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, furthermore, integration was, going to, was, was leading to a more stable and prosperous uh, uh, um, Europe. On the other hand, and this is the point that I made towards there, that the Americans obviously want to sort of minimise the economic cost to themselves of integration. But there is a hope in the 1950s and 1960s that the GATT would ultimately help to sort of reduce uh, the tariffs. Um, so there was an expectation that the common external tariff as a result of the GATT negotiations would eventually be lowered, if not uh, dismantled altogether. Um, Moreover, I think by the early 60s, there was an expectation or a hope anyway, that the European community would, could also be fitted into some wider Atlantic uh, framework. Um, 
And John F. Kennedy in 1962 makes a very famous address uh, on the you know, on, on, on the 12th of July, in which he talks about a declaration of interdependence between Europe and the United States. So you have a sort of Kennedy Kennedy's vision is, as I say, is of this sort of wider transatlantic community, not dissimilar, I suppose, to the vision that the British were pushing for in the early 1950s. The problem, though, is that by the 1960s, again, you have de Gaulle, and de Gaulle, although he's not much of an enthusiast when it comes to European integration has decided that if you are going to have a European community it needs to be a European community led by France and secondly it needs to be a European community which is which is sort of detached politically from the two superpowers he talks about Europe being a third force in world politics so Kennedy's vision of this sort of wider transatlantic community very much kind of clashes with the Gaullist vision, as I say, of a more of a Europe more independent from uh, the United States and, for that matter, the British. I mean, de Gaulle basically views you know, the British as being the 51st state, um, which is one of the reasons why you know he was keen to ensure that uh, they were excluded from the European club. Another thing. Uh, another area of concern for the United States uh, well, in the 1960s was the issue of burden sharing, which becomes increasingly acute. Part of the reason for that is that America's financial situation starts to deteriorate in the mid-1960s. The main reason for that is the costs of the Vietnam War. Um, so the Johnson administration, and there's, there's a very good article on the reading list uh, on, uh, on, on the Johnson administration's uh, uh, views about European integration. But essentially, Johnson basically says that the Europeans have to contribute more to, you know, to, to, to the cost of uh, defending Western Europe. Um, and this is where it gets very technical, because there are several rounds of intense negotiations, which ultimately lead to what become known as the offset uh, agreements, whereby Germany agrees to contribute uh, financially to the cost of American troops deployed um, inside West Germany. Um, but a general feeling on the part of the United States that European integration is not proceeding quickly enough. Um, moreover, and this is a point I sort of concluded on, um, in our previous class, you know, there, there is sort of resentment building in the Johnson administration for the fact that the British are withdrawing from eastern, from east of Suez, that the British are effectively withdrawing from the Pacific, the Middle East, um, and essentially committing themselves to being a regional power. Um, a quotation from President Johnson in the 60s, you know, a substantial part of my time is spent dealing with Europeans. We have sent our leaders to Europe, the Vice President, Secretary Rusk and others. There has been a very large exchange of information, even with all this, all the Europeans say they are neglected. What we need to do is to find a solution. We must find a way of getting them to make a larger contribution to the cost of NATO defence. Um, just by way of conclusion, then, I will also just add that I think American attitudes towards European integration sort of change in the 1970s. I haven't got a slide on this, but... Um, I would say Nixon, again, we're just getting slightly ahead of ourselves, but Nixon, when he becomes president, uh, he is markedly less sympathetic to European integration, not least because uh, I think there's a suspicion uh, inside the Nixon administration of any entity which could perhaps challenge America's leadership role. Um, also, you know, the Nixon administration basically says to the Europeans that, you know, if you want uh, um, the United States to, to be mainly responsible for your defence, um, you have to allow uh, the United States to have greater access to the European market. Um, again, it's worth noting that, you know, by the 1970s, the economic and financial situation in the United States, in common with the rest of the industrialized world, had deteriorated quite markedly. And I think that, as much as anything else, sort of explains why the Nixon administration's enthusiasm uh, for European integration was, uh, to put it mildly, rather cool. Um, after Nixon, you have Ford and then Carter, and I think Carter especially was much more pro-European in his vision. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, 
hard to say what, what exactly Reagan's view of European integration actually was, but but I would say probably less abrasive in the 19, early 1970s. Um, so in general, I mean, I would say, look, certainly in the first half of the Cold War, the United States does play a very important and quite constructive role in the process of European integration. Um, even after Johnson, as to some extent, Nixon, I think, is really the sort of exception in terms of his more sceptical view about the benefits of European integration to the United States. Um, yeah, I think throughout most of the Cold War, most American presidents played a reasonably supportive role. That kind of it continues, I would say, into the 90s with the, with the, uh, with the Clinton administration. Maybe a bit less so with George Bush, well, we're sort of heading into the 21st century now, which is sort of beyond my remit for this course at least. But yeah, George W. Bush, early 21st century, uh, probably more skeptical, certainly Trump, who is distinctly uh, unsympathetic to any sort of multilateral organisation, uh, is, is definitely not an enthusiast for, for uh, uh, the European Union. Um, but overall, as I say, you know, America does play a reasonably positive role in this process. And I will conclude on that point.